Okay, it is officially 530 on May 4th. May the 4th be with you. Thank you all for being here today. Welcome to a special presentation tonight with Daisy Stock and Kylie Tuituvuki from Symbrosia, a clean tech startup reducing livestock methane emissions using seaweed. We're all very excited that you're here. I am Jill Wirt, your MC, and I'm a project and research coordinator at Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. Tonight's presentation is part of Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's monthly Know Your Ocean Speaker Series, usually held on the first Wednesday of each month at 5.30 p.m. via Zoom. Maui Nui Marine Resource Council is celebrating 14 years of working for clean ocean water, healthy coral reefs, and abundant native fish. This monthly series is supported by the County of Maui Office of Climate Change, Resiliency, and Sustainability. A few things before we get going, you'll notice that your microphone is on mute. Please keep it on mute during the presentation to avoid any distractions. We invite you to submit questions by using the questions button on the lower edge of your screen, and we'll leave some time at the end of the presentation to answer your questions. And now it is my pleasure to briefly introduce our presenters. Daisy Stock leads the research and development team at Symbrosia with experience at NASA and conservation research in Panama, Moorea, and Hawaii. Kylie Tuituvuki is a member of the business development team with a background in anthropology and integrative biology, who also worked on several community-based research projects in Vanuatu, Moorea, and Hawaii. I'll leave it to them for a more comprehensive look at their backgrounds as they tell us more about Symbrosia as well. Daisy and Kylie, thank you again so much for being here, and I'll let you both take it from here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jill, for that great introduction. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see this? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so we are here today representing Symbrosia, um, talking to you about cultivating the world's mightiest seaweed, a Hawaii grown solution to the global climate problem. As Jill said earlier, my name is Kylie Tuituvuki. I'm a brand impact fellow here at Symbrosia. In my role, I facilitate outreach, community building, and storytelling for our partners throughout the Hawaiian Islands and the continental Southwest. In addition to that, I'm also a grad student at UH Manoa, studying archaeology and revitalization of indigenous cropping systems, mainly in Lo'i. Uh, before I worked in, at Symbrosia, I studied the impact of long-term agricultural management strategies on soil health, cultural heritage management, and other community-based projects like Vanuatu, Moorea, and Hawaii. And overall, I'm very passionate about equitable, inclusive, and community-centered research that empowers underserved communities in our fight against climate change. And hi, everybody. My name is Daisy Stock. I lead the research team investigating novel approaches to the cultivation of Asparagopsis or Limukohu. Uh, work on strain selection and development, starting with strain sourcing all the way through to improvements in scaled growth. Prior to joining the team at Symbrosia, I built my background in analytical chemistry, marine invertebrate sensory mechanisms, ecosystem conservation, and of course, algae. Um, I'm really passionate about inclusive community oriented science, and I'm really excited for the future of marine-based approaches to climate mitigation. Awesome. Uh, so, oops, go ahead. Um, some of the topics we're gonna be talking through today, uh, mainly why uh the role it plays in climate change and climate change mitigation. Uh, some of our research objectives, uh, supporting Hawaii communities and uplifting algae aquaculture as a whole. So, Given the fact that we're based here in Hawaii, we wanted to talk a little bit about the cultural significance of limu. So whether it's called seaweed, microalgae, or kelp, there are many different names for the plants of the ocean, but in Hawaii, it's limu. Uh, limu plays an important role in traditional Hawaiian ways of living. In food, it's used as a condiment that provided many vitamins and minerals. It was used in ceremony, either making lay or dyeing clothes. Limu kala is a specific species that was used in the practice of ho'oponopono, which was used to seek forgiveness and cleanse the mind and heart of wrongdoing. And it was also used in a medicinal context or la'au la'au. Uh, limu that served no specific purpose were not given specific names. 
And that why you, that's why you see some called just Limu and we have other ones like Limu Kala and Limu Kohu. Um, the traditional practices of the Kapu system allowed for natural management of coastal and marine resources. Uh, Kaulana Mahina or the Hawaiian moon calendar was used to track harvesting periods. And all of this is to say that there was an intimate knowledge of place, practice and understanding dynamic systems as a whole as a means of protecting ecosystems and assuring sustainable food sources. Limu also plays an important role in the marine ecosystem. It's an essential primary producer for nearshore fisheries and is foundational for marine food webs. It serves as a food source and provides shelter for invertebrates and other marine life. And all healthy reefs should have a diverse range of CO2 uptake and algae and balance with other, eco or other organisms like corals, invertebrates, and fish. The specific species that we work with here at Simbrosia is Limu Kohu, which means pleasing seaweed. And it's one of the most common edible Limu throughout Hawaii. Traditionally flavored with salt and dried, the upper branches were also used for long-term storage and they were pounded, rolled into balls and stored for months. Um, current cuisines include poke, lomi, and stewed meats. And it's only fit that we recognize the importance of Limu in our communities here in Hawaii and in the world. Earlier this year, 2022 was announced the year of the Limu. And while the Ito, formerly of Kua, noted that local, national, and international research organizations and institutions of higher learning are becoming more aware of the many uses and benefits of Limu. Many of these organizations are looking to Hawaii for advice and guidance. With that in mind, it's important that we maintain the balance. In an, un, in an industrial and rapidly developing world, it's necessary for us to maintain a balance between social development and sustainable life practices in nature and in the way that we do our research. One of these ways is by managing species in a safe manner. So the species Gorilla Ogo was introduced to meet growing desire for Limu, but under poor management regimes, quickly surpassed consumer demand and smothered local coral reef ecosystems. Another way that we can do this is by making sure that we are developing in a sustainable manner. Limu populations took a hit when runoff produced by increased urbanization affected water sources necessary for population growth as well as native Limu did not stand a chance when invasive species were introduced to Hawaii waters in the 1970s and 80s for aquaculture. Understanding the dynamic relationships between humans and our ecosystems is necessary for the sake of our planet and drives our work here at Sombrosia. We want to ensure that the work we are doing helps maintain and restore this balance, but the question is, how can we do that? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem that we are trying to address. Um, I want to start to uh, talking about the role that methane gas plays in global warming. Uh, as I'm sure everybody knows, climate change is a really time-sensitive issue that's going to require some time-sensitive solutions to mitigate. The reason methane emissions are so important to curb is due to warming potential. To compare, carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere for thousands of years, but methane stays in the atmosphere for only about a dozen years, but heats the planet much more intensely. This is caused by methane molecules being able to absorb much more energy than carbon dioxide molecules. Uh, to give you guys a sense of what that looks like, methane emitted today will have about 80 times the global warming effect of, as CO2 over the next 20 years. In the short term, re reducing methane emissions will have a much larger cooling effect than reducing carbon dioxide by the same amount. This is why we're so motivated to achieve a drastic reduction in methane emissions this decade. Uh, a warming climate poses huge threats to reef ecosystems. Uh, as consequences of global climate change, the sea sur surface temperature is expected to rise between one to three degrees and sea surface level is expected to rise between a half a foot to two and a half feet in the coming decades. Uh, this is ultimately gonna affect severity and frequency of storms, alter ocean circulation patterns and pH is expected to decline as a result of the absorption of CO2. Uh, this will disrupt natural habitat and food supply, cause changes in ocean chemistry, and reduce the abundance of phytoplankton and calcareous marine animals like coral, which are the backbone of coral reefs. Uh, there's expected to be a significant decrease in the quantity of marine plants in warmer waters, reducing the amount of nutrients available to animals further along the food chain, which along with weakened reefs from ocean acidification is going to have a huge impact in Hawaii. Um, but why methane from livestock? Uh, as it turns out, uh, cows and other farm animals have a tiny bit of a burping problem. Through their digestive process, livestock burps cause roughly 10% of total greenhouse gas emissions. And with demand for rumen and animal products rising, uh, the problem is very pressing. 
Uh, this digestive process called enteric fermentation is the digestive process through which a large group of animals, many of which are raised in large quantities, uh, digest kind of harder to digest food. The group includes cows, sheep, goats, buffalo, deer, uh, and not counting other animals, just cows alone, uh, if they were a country, would produce about as much greenhouse gas as the entire European Union. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about this digestion process to understand how our seaweed fits in. Uh, ruminant animals have a really large fore stomach or rumen in which microbial fermentation breaks down tough food like grass into a usable form for the animal. Uh, the decomposition and fermentation performed by the microbes produces methane as a byproduct uh, when hydrogen and carbon combine. This creates methane as a chemical byproduct and it's released whenever the animal burps or exhales. So how does the seaweed play in? Uh, in a 2014 study, Asparagopsis taxiformis outperformed all their types of seaweeds uh, screened for livestock methane reduction, reducing emissions by over 90% uh, with just a really small feed inclusion. Asparagopsis chemically reduces the naturally occurring methane without impacting the fatty acids that help ruminants make valuable products like milk, wool, and meat. So behind the chemistry of this process, a naturally occurring compound in the seaweed called bromoform blocks the hydrogen from the carbon, reducing methanogens through improved digestion. Continued research and feed trials have shown that the methane reductions hold up over time and using the supplement doesn't have any adverse effects on animal health or the products expected from these animals. Um, this photo is of a, like a magnified under a microscope piece of our algae. Um, and just to talk a little bit more about the compound referenced in the previous slide, bromoform, uh, Sparagopsis cells produce a wide range of halogenated compounds that help to prevent herbivory and fouling, bromoform being one of these compounds. Uh, they're synthesized and stored within specialized gland cells. If you look at the image of the seaweed, it's those kind of dark, darker spots on the inside of the cell. Um, and the compound within there that's of such interest to us is that bromoform. It's the active ingredient of our product sea grace, um, which works by disrupting the enzymes of gut micro microbes that live in the cow's stomach and help to interrupt that process of methanogenesis. So far, by using our little miracle seaweed, we have um, eliminated four tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, this is through feed trials with Midnight's Farm, a small farm on Lopez Island in Northwest Washington, and Z Farms, an organic farm in the village of Dover Plains, New York. Uh, Kylie is going to share a little bit more about this a few slides later, but upcoming trials will focus on feeding cows um, on Hawaii ranches. And all of our trials are conducted at no cost to the ranchers. So this is just a very brief sampling of all the literature that's come out regarding the seaweed, uh, focusing on safety and efficacy of the seaweed. And diving into our research a little bit further, um, our research starts with low impact algal sourcing. Uh, for the type of research that we're conducting and to start seed stocks for production on a larger scale, we need an incredibly small amount of the seaweed, just a few cells. This method of sampling doesn't remove any plants from the habitat or impact the distribution or population. I compare it to like pulling a leaf off of a really big tree. Uh, an additional benefit of returning to specific sites time and time again is being able to see how the environment has changed over time. Uh, talking to local limu collectors, it's become pretty clear that our experience of finding it somewhere and then never finding it at that site again isn't entirely unique, unfortunately, as anthropogenic activity is starting to impact seaweed distribution and populations. Um, as Kylie was saying, as the Varigopsis is found all over the archipelago, it's found on every Hawaiian island, uh, but different lineages comprise the different genetic identities. There are five identified cryptic lineages with most places that the Asparagopsis is found like Australia or Southern California only hosting one, maybe two lineages, but in Hawaii we have three. So we're, we've got a wealth of it. Um, and to provide some, some clarity, the photos from our research might look a little bit different than what you would expect Limakoku to look like. Uh, Asparagopsis has a triphasic life cycle, which it goes through in three distinct phases. Uh, the carposporophyte and gametophyte, those two kind of on the top, 
uh, sides of that chart um, are what's commonly recognized as lingo kopu. The third life stage is the tetrasporophyte life stage, and that's what we work with. It's kind of more like a filament. We call them puff balls. Um, they're much more fluffy um, and kind of floaty. Um, they look so different that originally they were identified as two completely different species. Um, and older literature will still refer to them as such, the Falkenbergia and the Asparagopsis. Now they're all known under the name Asparagopsis. Uh, so we are focused primarily on the tetrasporophyte life stage for land-based cultivation. And here's some pictures of our little friend. Um, the top left being a new filament branching on the tetrasporophyte life stage with some newly formed gland cells and slightly older cells. So if you see just above that spot where a new branch is coming out, there's a little dark circle. That's a gland cell starting to form and producing bromoform, our anti-methane compound. Uh, down in the circle, that's a really small fragment. Um, to give you guys an idea of how much we collect, that's probably like five times what we'd need to intake a new sample, so a very small amount. Um, and the third picture is reproductive bodies on a gametophyte. So some of our research focus and things that are really important to us are understanding the natural distribution and cycles of limakohu, optimizing growth conditions for resiliency and consistency, understanding the entire ecological role of Asparagopsis taxiformis um, and conducting feed trials to focus on rancher accessibility and animal health. Um, it's really important to us through all these processes that our research goals are aligned to scale the solution in a way that paves the way for sustainable aquaculture, thriving marine ecosystems and community oriented growth. Uh, some factors of this include growing our seaweed on non-arable land in Kona, uh, with the primary inputs being sun and seawater, no fresh water required, um, and using bioremediated waste from local fish farms to feed our algae. Uh, we're prioritizing the research of these improved methods to be even lower waste and uplift aquaculture technology as a whole. A lot of aquaculture operates pretty low tech, so there's a lot of advancements to be made as we move forward. So as we continue to scale and do our work here in Hawaii, we want to make sure that we are supporting Hawaii communities. We're doing that by um, contributing to restoration and conservation efforts. So as a company, we recognize that we contribute to the active displ displacement of Kanaka Maoli and directly benefit from living and working here in Hawaii. And as a way to Malama the Aina, Sambroja aims to support as many Kanaka serving, owned, and operated organizations as possible. Um, on our website, we encourage those who visit our, our site to donate to Kua. We're hiring local, Kanaka, local and Kanaka interns, as well as applying for grants that support ecosystem restoration efforts and speaking on platforms like this one here at Maui Nui. Additionally, we want to help provide for the local economy, mainly by providing a strong food system, but also allow for a food secure state. So concerns about being a primarily tourism based economy were solidified for us here in Hawaii during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, where nearly 70% of the state was unemployed. Local food systems, however, excelled during this period, with local revenue from dozens of food hubs throughout the state increasing threefold. So elevating local food systems creates a food secure state and aids in this transition towards a more circular and Hawaii serving economy. And one way we can do this is by partnering with local and Hawaii serving owned and operated businesses and organizations. So some of the Hawaii-based partners that we've started talking to or have formed partnerships with include ranchers, farmers, and producer, producers like those at Hana Ranch, Hana Ranch um, the Hawaii Cattlemen's Council, and the Paneva Feed Mill, as well as partnering with institutions and organizations like UH Hilo and HFA or the Hawaii Food Alliance. Um, and as we continue to scale, we want to make sure that we're creating a market that values these climate smart commodities in a way that promotes um, environmental justice and uplifts minority serving institutions and other marginalized groups. And we're doing this by partnering with small scale ranchers, farmers and producers throughout the Hawaiian islands and across the continental United States. We're planning on growing in an equitable, accessible and environmentally just way by breaking down economic barriers for small scale producers, creating networks that connect climate smart producers to buyers that want to support climate efforts and by looking at other climate byproducts like selling off carbon credits and naturally nutrient rich fertilizers. Um, and all of this is to say that we are working towards changing the livestock and agricultural industries for a more equitable and climate focused future, all with the power of you. And we also encourage anyone who wants to, to donate to uh, Kua or Kua Aina Ula Almoa, which is the traditional Limu knowledge um, organization that we partner with. That's it. 
Wonderful. Oh my goodness, you are both incredibly busy. What a great presentation. I mean, so much information coming out of there and it's just really great to learn about uh, different ways to solve the climate crisis. So we really appreciate that and for you both to take the time and, and share more about it. So we have um, plenty of time for questions and we already have a couple in the Q&A. So I'll just go ahead and, and start there if you're both ready for that. Um, first question, can you address how long propane stays in the atmosphere? Hawaii County is planning to take the methane from the closed Hilo transfer station, which is currently just outgassing and replace some propane uses with it for LMI residents, especially. Mm. I actually, I'm not sure that I can speak to retention time of propane in the atmosphere. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, we can go to the next one. Will this be limu cell culture like cell culture meat? No, um, it's grown rep on land-based systems kind of replicating um, the way that we'd find it in the natural environment. So kind of just scaling the environment we'd find it in um, and controlling all the inputs in a way that grows our target to distributable quantities. Great. Um, next question. I love this new, this novel new concept. Unfortunately, everything has to do with money. What will this cost the cattle ranchers, especially mm -hmm. in middle America, and how will they benefit financially from using it? I love this question. There's actually a lot of really interesting research and results coming out of kind of this concept. Um, essentially, when the cows aren't wasting the energy, if methane's an energy source, to, to burp it out, they're able to kind of digest that and make use of that energy. The animals that are fed asparagopsis end up having a little bit higher of a feed conversion ratio, meaning that the cows raised for beef get a little fatter, the dairy producing cows produce a little more, and it's less time from when they're born to when they can go to slaughter or you know, move towards becoming the product. Um, past that, there's a lot of compounds found in seaweed naturally that overlap with vitamin supplements, which is one of the most expensive supplements that farmers will include in their feed. So it can kind of be like uh, feeding two birds with one scone um, that you're <laughs> giving them the vitamins along with the asparagopsis, which is you know maybe giving them some kind of tax benefit or you know, making their cows grow to full size a little bit faster or produce more milk. Uh, meanwhile, they don't have to spend money on quite as many vitamins. Um, but the price point we're looking at is comparable at the moment to um, vitamins that they would be purchasing anyways. Wow, that is, that's so cool. I just, I just love learning all about this. Kylie, did you have another part to that or? Um... Um, yeah, that's a great way of explaining the science side of it too. On the business end, we're also looking at a way to allow ranchers who use our product to sell off that carbon output. So selling off carbon credits, essentially. Um, we're also looking at other things like using manure that it was, it's produced by a cow that's on our feed additive as a natural sort of fertilizer. So instead of adding synthetic fertilizers and all of those minerals back into the soil, we kind of have this like self-regulating ecosystem. Amazing. And I know um, at Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, we have a reef-friendly landscaping project that's trying to uh, get properties to stop using those synthetic fertilizers because they do pose so many problems to the reef, like eutrophication and things like that. So um, that's, that's great news as well. And I'll just keep rolling with the Q&A if that's all right with you both. Um, what is the economic case for using seaweed in cow feed? I know you mentioned that the cost was covered for cattle farms in Hawaii, but looking beyond the scope of the trials, what is the economics of this look like? I'll let you take that one, Kylie. <laughs> Um, you know, we're in the process of scaling, looking at ways that we can implement um, our seed additive across the continent and eventually potentially globally. In all of the cases of us creating partnerships, our, all of our feed trials, all of the, the additive is covered. So there's no cost to the ranchers for us supplying the product. We are trying to look for new ways to reduce the amount of labor that's needed to work with us on trials, um, trying to be as economical 
and equitable as possible. Our goal is to work with small scale ranchers and farmers trying to make them as competitive as these large industrial sized um, agricultural producers. So we're, we're sort of working on that. It's, it's moving pieces as we continue to scale, we're trying to find ways to be as economical um, and equitable as possible. Wonderful. Um, and how applicable is this type of seaweed for cattle in other locations? Well, I guess you're, you're already doing trials in, on the um, continental US. Yeah, so our feed additive is not Hawaii specific in terms of only being able to be used in Hawaii. Uh, it's just cultivated here. So it can be used pretty much in any, any landscape. Great. Another one, maybe take us uh, through a step-by-step -step of how you grow the seaweed, what it, what it looks like, how, you know, from harvesting to, you know, the product. Yeah, totally. Um, so as I showed with the pictures, we collect just a tiny bit of it. Um, from that step, we have some methods to get it to grow unialgally, meaning that it's the only algae that's in our system, which is really great for being able to control contamination, have a product control at the end of the day, making sure that we know exactly what's in it, just our seaweed. Um, so we grow it in that form unialgally in really big land-based tanks or raceways. Um, and from there, you know, it's just the sun, the salt water that's kind of pumped up at Nelha, which is the facility that we run out of, um, add some fertilizer and that's basically it. Um, from there, the processing step of it um, is still kind of up for debate in the way that's easiest. Uh, some of the research we're doing is trying to make sure that it's something that's really accessible for farmers to use so they don't have to change the entire way they're running their operations so that ranchers can just kind of fold it into the practices they're already doing. Um, so that's something we're trying to develop alongside them to make sure that we're staying respectful of the, the methods that they've already developed. Great. Yeah, I was curious about that if um, with ranchers and how they're putting out their feed. Is it, you know, are you putting the seaweed in, in these big bags that you give to the farmers, they just mix it all together? Or is it already mixed into the feed? Like what... What does that look like? It's a bit of a different approach, uh, mainly differentiated if they're free range grass fed or in a feedlot. Um, it ends up being a little easier in a feedlot because you can put it in the trough right in front of the animal, whereas free range grass fed, they're wandering around. It's a little harder to make sure that each cow is getting its, um, its dose um, at a determined uh, interval. So we're working out a way to to do that in a way that's not super time intensive for the, the, the ranchers, but that's kind of the difference between the two. Got it, thank you. Um, where, where would a farmer growing or raising beef contact you to find out how to be a part of the program? So on our website, we have a contact us form. If you are a current land steward or a rancher or producer, you can go ahead and fill out a little survey. Um, we respond to those as often as we can. Yeah, and I'm actually one of the people that respond to the contact us form, so. Great. I have the, um, I have the link copied right now, actually, if you want me to drop it in the chat. Yeah, that would be great. Um, the website link with the, okay, perfect, responding to that one. Thank you. Um, four tons of, okay, four tons of CO2 removed proves your seaweed works. How long until you scale to globally impactful levels? Yeah, that's a great question. As we said, we're, we're trying to really follow the sense of urgency with this problem um, since the methane is such an immediate threat. Um, so the research that we're doing right now and all of the trials that we're going through are to expand and to grow it um, in a way that's economically feasible. Um, and I'd say we're, we've got some, some parts of that, some really uh, instrumental parts of that figured out. Um, so it's just a matter of continuing to build that infrastructure um, and expand uh, kind of our facilities. But definitely within, you know, within the next few years, we're going to be tackling some much larger amounts of CO2 equivalent than that. Right. And I'm, I, there's a lot of um, regulation involved with aquaculture as well, like getting permits to do it, I feel like can be challenging. Um, is that, 
is that why maybe you you all chose to be in Kona was because of you know the accessibility for the infrastructure there or were there other places that you've looked at that could be another like larger operation I guess yeah uh, we were actually brought to Hawaii by kind of a happy coincidence our founder Alexia Akbai uh, was part of the hatch accelerator program which is based out of Nelha so coming here and then it was just the perfect coincidence that uh, asparagus grew here anyways that Nelha has plumbed deep seawater and non-arable land. It all kind of fit together really nicely, but, what, but we'd be looking at kind of similar places to expand into likely in the future. And then that kind of leads in, are, you, are there any other companies pursuing this work or are you the game changers, any market valuation estimates? Um, we are one of the only organizations in the United States kind of doing this work. There are other operations happening in New Zealand and Australia, but as of now, we are one of the only operating out of the U.S. So, mm -hmm. And it's such a, there's billions of cows. It's like the market is, is really huge. So kind of at this point, like <clears throat> it, there is some competition in the space, but not so much in the sense of trying to be the only one. It's more so that everybody who's doing it is really interested in the impact that this work can have. Um, and we're gonna need a ton of asparagopsis grown to feed every cow in the world, so. Um, right, that kind of feels like the biggest hurdle is how mm -hmm. how can you grow more limu faster and more, like in the most sustainable way too, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, can you talk more about the conversations with ranchers, especially Maui ones? Um, how are they reacting? And when will trials start on Maui if they haven't already? Yeah, so we are really excited to be partnering with Hawaii-based ranches. Um, our goal is to help up with the Hawaii economy and being based in Hawaii, we kind of see them as our starting partnerships. Um, we are in conversation with the ranchers on Maui. We are planning on running a trial with Hana Ranch, um, as well as dipping into the pool that is the Maui Cattlemen's Company, hoping that we can create a partnership with them. And usually we've gotten really positive reactions from the ranchers that we've spoken to here in Hawaii and on the mainland. A lot of people recognize that methane from livestock is a huge like, problem with climate change. And so, they want to make sure that they are running in a sustainable way, trying to still be able to produce livestock while also being environmentally friendly. Um, so a lot of people have responded really positive to the work that we're doing. Great. Yeah, I'm always curious how that um, how how that conversation starts. Of hey, we're growing seaweed to feed your cows. You know, it just seems like people probably have never heard of it or thought of it, and um, so that's great that people yeah. are, on, are on board and willing to try. <laughs> yeah, it's actually really interesting. A lot of ranchers that we've talked to have heard about asparagopsis taxiformis, learning about seaweed that reduces methane emissions. They don't always have um, an understanding of how we kind of play into that. So it's always interesting when we talk to them about this is the seaweed that we grow and they've already heard of it. Um, they're also really interested in working on a dynamic system level so one question that I always get is what happens to the output, right? So we are giving them a speed additive, they're adding it to the cattle, it's doing all of what it's supposed to do. Um, and then this really nutrient rich manures on output. So they're thinking in these like large systematic levels of like, oh, we can incorporate that into our ranches, we can sell that, you know, thinking about them as a dynamic system and not just kind of like a one stop shop, which is which is really cool. A lot of people are really interested in, in doing that kind of regenerative work overall. Right, yeah, nothing goes to waste. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, so another question. Can the limu growing process happen farther from Hawaii, like inland of the mainland? I guess um, maybe with the input of salt water, that might be a barrier, but um, I'll let you, that's just my take. I'll let you answer the question. <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth. The um, accessibility to seawater is super, super vital. You need to be able to kind of like flush the systems and uh, have access to a large amount of seawater. Um, so that's that's a really big thing. And then another uh, huge aspect is sunlight. So in Kona, we're in a rain shadow um, from the, the Mana and 
just in the exact right spot where it rarely ever rains. The clouds that kind of gather rarely make it down to Kona. Um, and if we do have a cloudy day, you can see the output of the seaweed like drop. We will have like a huge decrease in production uh, rates if a, if a cloud drifts kind of over for the day. Um, so definitely finding places that are super sunny um, and that have access to seawater in the right temperature range are all things that are really important. Along with that sun, you get a lot of systems heating up. So the fact that we have deep seawater that runs really cold, accessible to uh, cool our systems in a non-energy intensive way is also really important. Right. All of that, all of that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Okay, and we touched on this a little bit, but we can we can revisit it. What about when the cattle is just grazing, not feeding from the feedlot? Have you looked at adding the algae for when cattle are grazing? Mm -hmm. So yeah, based on those questions or on those conversations that we've had with ranchers, um, it's gonna need to be a little bit of a dynamic solution to that. Luckily, a lot of the operations that are doing that um, on the island are kind of smaller herds. Um, so we're working working on a solution for that um, right now. Great. Are you considering expanding to the east side of Hawaii Island? A little too rainy. <laughs> right. <laughs> you. That sunlight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, this is a fun one. What's your favorite thing about working at Symbrosia? <laughs> Um, I guess I can go first. I think one of my favorite things about working at Symbrosia is the collaborative and innovative workspace that we all kind of vibe in. I think we provide a really safe environment for ideas to bounce off of one another, which allows for a lot of the innovation that we're seeing um, on our lab site and on the business development team as well. Um, so I think that in everyone's positive attitude, it's, it's very great for a collaborative workspace. Yeah, I would, I would agree with Kylie 100%. Um, a huge thing for me too in joining the team was I kind of have a background more so in uh, marine biology, marine science, uh, but had a deep care um, and motivation personally to uh, be involved with solving the climate crisis. So finding a place where those two things intersected and finding the solution um, that's so, it, it matters so deeply to everybody here that the everybody that's a part of the solution feels like they're a part of the solution and gets to have their input heard. Um, like Kylie was talking about, not just being like a one-stop shop, here's the seaweed, we're doing our part, but it's like building, building the solution in a way that's so multifaceted and benefits so many people and systems. Right. Great. It sounds like a really collaborative and motivating place to work. You feel challenged, but inspired. So that's great. And another question, you hero is proposing a Hawaii state carbon market, and they believe the federal proposed carbon market might be about a $46 per ton incentive. How can the carbon market help Symbrosia? I don't have an answer for this question right now, but I feel like this is a really great conversation that we could have and I'll pop my email in the chat and so maybe uh, Michelle if you're interested in talking more about this we can hop on a zoom call sometime and have a more in-depth conversation about that awesome thanks and last question that I'm seeing in the Q&A box where are you getting your funding and when do you hope to be self-sustaining and profitable Um, we are getting our funding from several donors. We've applied for a lot of USDA grants and other federal funding grants, which I think is kind of what got us off the ground in our initial stages of um, operation. I'm not super, we, we are in the stage of negotiating with donors and closing out a funding round and applying for, for more funding to help us scale for the future. So that's where we're at on the funding side. Great, startups. It's all, I think that's the, the most challenging part is actually starting up and getting that funding to do so. So best of luck um, for your funding round. And we do still have some time. So if people have more questions, feel free to drop them in now. Um, I'm just double checking the chat, the Q&A box and 
if not, then we may be finishing just a little bit early today. I can go ahead and um, do some closing out announcements and uh, everyone can enjoy their the rest of their Wednesday evening. So um, Daisy and Kylie, thank you both again. So, oh wait, there one more came in. Okay, have you prepped a um, school-friendly slide deck, elementary, middle, or high school? Not one recently. For a while, we had high school apprentices from a local high school in Kona. Um, and so at that time, I think we had a little bit more palatable introductory material, but that's a great idea. Um, I can definitely make one of those. Uh, would anybody, would people be interested if, I guess they can't answer, but um, I can make one and we can, <laughs> uh, we can see about distributing that. I will also put my email in the, in the chat. Yeah, I think, um introducing students to it and because I, I also think just when I was starting with environmental science and marine biology there's just there's so many avenues you can go down and I think the more things that you can share regarding technology you know limu especially with how important limu is here like get students excited and interested it's a different way to think about climate change as well um, yeah, I think that that would be awesome. And if if you can share that even with Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, I just talked to some high schoolers last week um, and would be happy to just share, you know, different solutions next time I do that. So wonderful job, wonderful presentation. This is this has been recorded, so it'll be up on our Facebook page as well as our YouTube page and we'll be able to share it. Um, but thank you both again so much for being here and telling us all about Symbrosia Seaweed Solution um, to reduce livestock methane emissions. I'll go ahead and close us out now. So feel free to hang around um, and we'll see you next time. So to our audience, thank you all for attending Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's Know Your Ocean Speaker Series sponsored by the County of Maui Office of Climate Change, Resiliency and Sustainability. Maui Nui Marine Resource Council is a nonprofit celebrating 14 years of working for clean ocean water, healthy coral reefs, and an abundance of native fish for the islands of Maui Nui. Our next Know Your Ocean Speaker Series event will take place on Wednesday, June 1st at 5.30 p.m. via Zoom. We'll be hosting our partners, Miley Shannon and Scott Crawford from the Maui Nui Makai Network with a presentation titled, Weaving the Net, How We Are Connecting Communities for a Healthy Land and Sea of Tomorrow. Speakers will share the story of the Maui Nui Makai Network, including ongoing projects and vision for the future. To hear about signing up for this talk and to learn about other future presentations, please sign up for a free subscription to our monthly e-newsletter, Reef and Brief at MauiReefs.org. Join the Maui Visitor and Convention Bureau this Saturday, May 7th for Malama Lanai Restoration Day. Trilogy excursions will bring visitors from Lahaina to Lanai and the Expeditions Ferry will provide the return trip to Lahaina. You'll be able to participate in a variety of learning and volunteerism activities with Pulama Lanai and have a chance to explore Lanai City and visit the Cultural and Heritage Center. You can call Trilogy at 808-874-5649 and ask for the Malama Lanai Restoration Day. And then book your ferry online at go-lanai.com for the 5.30 p.m. return ferry. Another exciting announcement, artist Maggie Sutrov has officially published her first Ulana Aina video, Planting for Coral. Weaving art and conservation education together, Maggie creates stunning paintings of different conservation projects around Maui and creates video lessons for others to learn how to recreate her paintings. Join Maggie as she paints on site with Maui Nui Marine Resource Council and the Coral Reef Alliance. She explores how our actions on land can affect Maui's coral reefs and how art can make a different difference. She then teaches a step-by-step -step art lesson where students can express how they will care for the coral reef and see how their creative choices affect their painting's ocean in real time. Visit paintthere.com slash ulana-aina to access the lesson.
You can support Huyoka Viola by adopting your favorite beach for water quality testing or by becoming a trained water quality sampling volunteer. This community-based water quality monitoring program launched and conducted by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, the Nature Conservancy, and West Maui Ridge Trees Initiative in partnership with the State of Hawaii Department of Clean Health Water Branch tests ocean water quality every three weeks at 29 locations in South and West Maui. So that's 17 sampling sessions every year at all of our sites. Visit huiokaviola.com to learn more. When you donate to Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, you'll also be supporting our work to improve the ocean water quality in Ma'alaya Bay. Our projects include our oyster bioremediation project, which has caged oysters in the bay, filtering sediment and other pollutants out of the water. We're also stabilizing the slopes of Pohakea watershed to prevent sediment runoff by planting vetiver grass, which is a non-spreading, deep-rooted, drought and fire-resistant plant that keeps soil from washing into the ocean during rainstorms. So far, we've planted 2,300 vetiver plants. If you've missed some or all of tonight's presentation, once again, you'll be able to view it on Facebook Live on our Maui Nui Marine Resource Council Facebook page, and it will also be posted to our YouTube channel, Maui Reefs. And last but not least, we want to thank all of our sponsors and supporters who are making our work possible. And we also wish to thank individual donors like you. Mahalo for making a difference. Thank you all again for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. May the fourth be with you and we will see you all next month for our next speaker series. Aloha.